ladies and gentlemen, Robert Rapier. I would have requested welcome to the jungle. I was jealous when Mark walked out this morning to that. I always dreamed about that, welcome to the jungle, as I walk out and take the stage. So, I understand I have a little bit of an accent. I can't hear it, but I can hear that you all have accents. But uh, I'm going to, as I get to going here, I've got 40 minutes, 46 slides. Um, I'll get wound up and talk fast, and hopefully you guys can understand everything that I say. So. Slide is not, there it is, okay. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of my, my background, my biography, who I am. Uh, I'm gonna talk about, basically, a lot of the message you've heard today is that uh, the oil and gas industry is really underappreciated in the country for what it does. And I'm gonna take you to an alternative reality where the fracking boom had never happened, shale oil and gas boom never happened. I will talk a little bit about the downside of, the, uh, of, of fracking. But, uh, you know, the very, very underappreciated upside, uh, you're going to hear that message. And the, the tremendous impact that it has had on the global oil and gas markets. I'm going to talk to you about why California is missing out on the shale boom. I'll contrast that with Texas, and it's a very, very stark contrast. And then uh, I'll close with uh, a bit of the environmental concerns of fracking. Now, again, Mark this morning said that... Uh, one of the problems with this industry is we don't take time to correct people. I do. Um, so I might, to, to my wife's chagrin, I will argue with people, you know, there'll be a meme shared with 30,000 views, and I will stay there and I will argue with people, and I say, you just don't understand. This is misinformation. I have to correct it. She says, well, I'm going to this wedding anyway. So I, that happens all the time. So. I grew up on a farm in Oklahoma, uh, was not expected to go to college. I started taking classes at community college. Um, in, uh, I'm from southeastern Oklahoma, right across the river in Paris, Texas. I started taking classes there. I transferred to a four-year school, got bachelor's degrees in chemistry and math, and then I transferred to graduate school at Texas A&M and got a master's in chemical engineering. And I was the first in my, my family to go to college. Uh, they expected me to stay and, and run the farm, or at least stay around the area. Not too many people got out. Um, about 2005, I started writing about energy, and that sort of took off. And uh, since then, I've written in a lot of publications. I write a regular gig for Forbes now. People kept coming up to me last night, oh, you're the Forbes guy. I'm not really the Forbes guy. I'm, uh, that takes less than 5% of my time. Uh, Forbes told me I was their most read energy columnist last year, but I'm not the Forbes guy. I'm a chemical engineer. I have a full-time day job. Uh, you know, we work on oil field flaring. We turn that into power. That's my day job. And I have another full-time job with Investing Daily, which I've done for more than six years. Uh, I'm their energy strategist. I've run one of their publications. One of the first things I did when taking over is I added Shell and Chevron to the portfolio, where they've been ever since. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I have been on 60 Minutes uh, with Leslie Stahl. That's entirely because I started writing about energy. Um, I, I was very combative with some of the people who were spreading misinformation, and they liked that, so they, they got me on there. Been on, there's a, that's a picture of me on CNBC on Squawk Box. Um, that was after writing something about OPEC. I've learned that poking a stick in OPEC's eye is very, very popular. Uh, you know, writing things about Venezuela and how that system has not worked, that's very popular. So those are, I can always go to those for, uh, for lots of hits. But some guy can write about Pokemon Go and he can get a year's worth of my views in, in one article. That, you know, he can get millions of views in one article. And I, I got about two million views on my articles last year. So, I want to take you to the energy scene in the U.S. a decade ago. Now, you may not appreciate this, you may not appreciate where we were and what it looked like, but that's what I want to talk about. So U.S. oil production had grown throughout the 1900s up until 1970, and it began to decline. And it went into decline for the next almost 40 years, and production was down 48% by 2008. OPEC controlled 70% of the world's oil reserves, and that's still true, by the way.
So our net imports, that is what we bring in of gasoline, crude oil, diesel, and so forth, minus what we ship out, had grown to more than 12 million barrels a day at one point. And at the max, that was adding nearly half a trillion dollars to our trade deficit. So really having a negative impact, we were making OPEC very, very wealthy. So Mark mentioned peak oil this morning. Um, peak oil fears really began to accelerate in about 2005. The late Matt Simmons wrote a book called Twilight in the Desert. He argued Saudi's oil production was about to peak and that would spell disaster for the world. He made a wager that oil prices would be $200 a barrel in 2010. I have caught him coming off the stage more than once to say that's wrong, you're wrong about this or that. Um, Roscoe Bartlett talked about peak oil on the, on the floor of the house and it really began to get a lot of traction. Hurricane Katrina caused shortages and people started thinking about, wow, this is what shortages might look like and very high oil prices might look like. Uh, Ken DeFaze from my home state of Oklahoma also passed away last year, but he had a famous quote. He said, by 2025, we're going to be back in the Stone Age. And this is because of the dependence of the world on oil and the fact that he believed that it was going to decline. Another thing he said was, by 2009, there is nothing possible of, of preventing peak oil. By 2009, we are definitely going to be in a crisis. So the price of West Texas Intermediate from 2002 began to rise, and it had tripled uh, by 2005. OPEC's response was, the market is adequately supplied, and that led to some fears, well, OPEC is just blowing smoke, they really can't produce any more oil. And OPEC was starting to like the idea of higher and higher oil prices. You know, that a lot of money flowing out of the U.S. into OPEC. So that's Matt Simmons there. I don't mean to pick on him, but he made some very, he, he was on TV all the time making these predictions. And so he was kind of the go-to guy for those doom and gloom predictions. Um, this is uh, 2008. He says the only way is down. There is absolutely nothing that can prevent us from peak oil. And all of these peak oil stories in the media uh, started to, to really cause fear. And oil prices went on a run. And in the summer of 2008, oil prices nearly hit $150 a barrel. Now, one interesting thing, I always had it in my mind that as oil prices went up, um, the poorer countries, the developing countries, would be priced out of the market. The exact opposite happened. As oil prices took off, there was nearly no change in demand in developing countries. And I didn't really understand that for a long time until I went to India and I saw seven people riding on a motorcycle. And I said, that is it. Oil, just a little incremental oil production from billions of people has a tremendous impact on demand. And so, you know, if oil is $100 a barrel, really, if I can put seven people on the motorcycle and drive them 25 miles, that makes a big difference in my quality of life. Whereas in the U.S., you know, we can cut back a little bit on a trip to grandma's house or, uh, you know, get a little more fuel-efficient vehicle. So our demand did go down a bit as, as uh, oil prices went up. U.S. natural gas outlook was also bleak. Production had seemingly peaked in 1973 at almost 22 trillion cubic feet. Again, Matt Simmons in 2003 predicted we have a certain natural gas crisis in front of us, and he said the only, the only possible hope is to pray. I mean, there, there's nothing else that can, that can solve this. And natural gas prices were spiking. So what he was saying rung true with everybody. I mean, the, the, it looked like we were going to have a, a, a crisis. ConocoPhillips, my former employer, I, I used to work for ConocoPhillips um, before my current job. I worked in the North Sea and, and uh, several places. And our CEO was very concerned about natural gas. And he went out and he made a big acquisition of a natural gas company. And ExxonMobil did the same thing. And it turned out that we did it just about the peak of natural gas prices. And I remember our economics said, we believe that natural gas will be at least $7 a million BTU as far as the eye can see, and that was the price that basically made sense for us to make that acquisition. Chenier Energy was building a natural gas, an LNG, liquefied natural gas import terminal. It was, it was so strongly believed that we were going to have a crisis, we'd be importing natural gas from, from other countries. So the U.S. government response to this. We got the Energy Policy Act of 2005. It was a 551-page energy bill. Uh, Kern County, California is mentioned four times in that bill. 
Um, we got biofuel mandates out of that bill. We got all kinds of energy policies that, had they not happened, I wouldn't be standing here today because the biofuel mandates that they created, there was so much misinformation out there that in 2005, about the time that bill was being passed, that's when I started writing. And I wrote because I lived in Montana at the time. The, Mont the ethanol lobby there was trying to get a, a statewide mandate. And my refinery said, would you took off from there? I, uh, I tangled with uh, Vinod Kosla, Silicon Valley resident, who was uh, a big recipient of funds. Uh, he made a lot of promises about biofuels, especially advanced biofuels. You know, right now, today, we we're supposed to be making, you know, 100 billion gallons of ethanol from, from wood chips and so forth, and that never materialized. That's why I was on 60 Minutes. He, he was interviewed, I was interviewed. He, he made the pitch that we're going to make gasoline out of wood chips, and I, I said, he may do it, but uh, it's going to cost $15 a gallon. And I, I predicted, Leslie Stahl asked me, she said, what's going to happen to this company? I said, I believe by the end of the year they'll be bankrupt. And the company was called Kior. They were bankrupt by the end of the year. So all this is going on. There's terrible fear. Um, oil prices are spiking. Natural gas prices are spiking. And in the oil patch, these three guys right here were, were spawning a revolution. Now. In a longer version of this, I'll tell you a little bit more about these guys. If you don't know them, read the book, The Frackers. This will tell you about what these guys accomplished. Um, these guys have done more to reduce carbon dioxide emissions in the U.S. than all the renewable energy that we've put out there so far. And that's a fact. I, I, I come to you with facts, and, and I can back these facts up. You challenge me on this, I will show you. What, what has happened, and I'll talk to you about this a little bit uh, in, in a little bit, what happened was natural gas prices, which I'll show, plummeted as a result of what these guys did, and utilities started swapping out coal for natural gas. And they're also doing that with renewables, but the lion's share of the emissions reduction came from natural gas, which came as a result of what these guys had done. So, quickly, what is fracking? We say fracking, we really mean two things. We mean horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. Now, I, get, I, I, I like this graphic because it kind of shows you up close what happens. Fracking doesn't require horizontal drilling. Fracking's been around for a long time, but fracking with horizontal drilling, you drill down, you turn horizontal, you can take these horizontals out a very long distance, you can hydraulically fracture them, and then sand in that fluid helps keep those fractures open. That marriage between these two created the shale boom in the U.S. So hydraulic fracture was actually invented, uh, developed in the U.S. In the, in the 1940s. And over a million wells in the U.S. have been, have been hydraulically fractured. Horizontal drilling really began to take off in the 1990s. Really, the last, you know, in the early 2000s is really when it, when it accelerated. And today, more than 70% of all oil and gas wells in the U.S. are horizontal fracked wells. And when somebody says shale boom, that's what it is. It's a horizontal fracked well that has brought all of these. I mean, these, these, these resources were known to be there. They were just never economical to produce. And in the beginning, it took $100 oil to start to produce this oil. And over time, prices went down, and now, You'll hear them, you know, Shell said, you know, we've got some wells that are economical at $20, $25. And it was high, the high oil prices that made that possible. So this just shows in the early 90s, almost all the wells that were drilled were vertical. Uh, I think about, what, 90, 80, 80 percent. And around 2009, the horizontal wells overtook the vertical wells. And now you can see that 90 percent of all wells that are drilled are horizontal. And, and if you think about that, the reason is you got an oil formation, it's thin and wide, and if you drill a vertical well, you go through that formation. If you drill a horizontal well, you can just send it out all the way down the formation. You can access a much greater amount of that formation by horizontal drilling and then, and then fracking that. So it was the marriage of these two that created the shale gas, oil and gas boom, or the fracking boom in the U.S. In the lower 48, we have these shale plays, and some of those names are probably familiar to you. Uh, the Bakken Formation in North Dakota, uh, that, was a, that was a big play. Um, most of the natural gas is in the Appalachia Basin, 
up in the Northeast, up under Pennsylvania, uh, mostly. The, the natural gas production there has just skyrocketed. And not far behind that now is the Permian Basin, which has become such a major oil producer that it is on a trajectory to become the top oil field in the world, which was unfathomable a decade ago. Gawar in Saudi Arabia is, produces five million barrels a day. And the Permian Basin now is up to four, I believe. And, and they're on a trajectory that they probably will catch Gawar and, and Permian Basin will be the top producing oil region in the world. So you have your own uh, shale resources here, uh, but you've not participated in the shale boom, and I will, I will get into that. So what happened? The US, U.S. natural gas production turned upward in 2005, and it increased by 51% over the next decade. Fastest increase in U.S. history, we became the world's leading natural gas producer. We, we outstripped Russia, and now we're comfortably in first place as a, as a natural gas producer. Natural gas prices collapsed. And actually, Chenier's import terminal, they, they uh, changed it, and now they've got an export terminal. And now we are exporting a lot of liquid natural gas. Again, something completely unfathomable a decade ago that we would be doing this. Um, ExxonMobil and, and uh, ConocoPhillips would have never made those acquisitions if they had had a crystal ball and could see this happening. In the 150 plus year uh, oil industry, history of the oil industry in the U.S., oil production rose at the fastest rate in U.S. history. And I often talk about the irony that uh, George Bush was an oil man and oil production declined all eight years he was in office. And, but these guys were doing the fracking behind the scenes. And you can see that it's starting, to dis, it's starting to slow down. But when Obama came into office, he benefited from what those guys had done, those shale guys had done. And oil production increased for seven of the eight years he was in office. And I know he took credit for that sometimes. And that's when I said, no, no, not so fast. That's a, you, Obama was, was pretty hostile to the oil industry, and the oil production increased despite rules that they passed. Um, you know, those three guys, they, they had far more to do with that than any politician or inter, any energy policy that we passed. The U.S., so there's where Matt Simmons said, you know, the only way is down. And one lesson from that is, don't, you can't predict the future. I mean, I, I would tell people this again and again. You know, my, my book, I showed the, I didn't mention it, but my book actually has the word peak oil in the title. And I was against that. The publisher said, no, no, we, we think that's a selling point. And I wasn't advocating for peak oil, even though I, I had concerns, definitely concerns. I was always more of the mind that it's, it, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. I, I'd always say, you know, I look at it as probability. Are we at $20 peak oil? Yeah, probably. At $20, we probably won't continue to go to oil production. But are we at $100 peak oil? No, I don't think so. I think oil production will continue to grow. But I certainly didn't foresee this. I didn't foresee 6 million barrels a day of oil production being added. Very few people saw it. Every once in a while, I'd have somebody tell me this. That they'd say, you have no idea how much oil and gas we're about to put out there. And I'd say, you know, I, this, this guy, he, just, he doesn't know. He's just really optimistic. But they, they were right. We added 6 million barrels a day of oil over that time frame. And to put that in perspective, the U.S. added two-thirds of the new oil production over that, uh, over that time frame. Between 2008 and 2015, we added far more than OPEC, and then out of OPEC, Saudi Arabia, and then I show the other world's major oil producer, Russia, and the U.S. Uh, just dwarfed all of those. We, we're putting so much oil out on the market that wasn't expected by anyone. Now, this sent shockwaves throughout the world. I mean, OPEC is, is having to cope now. They, they didn't take the shale boom seriously at first, and then they tried a strategy that really backfired on them. And if you think about it from OPEC's perspective, so if you go back to the OPEC oil embargo, you know, they had 50% of the global oil market at one time. And then they had the OPEC oil embargo. There was such a backlash against that. They didn't recover for years. And then finally, they got back up to about 40% of the world market. 
And what they saw with the shale boom is they saw, you know, we're going to start losing. If, they continue, if the U.S. continues to put a million new barrels on the market every year, we're going to have to do something about this. Now, there's two ways they could have gone. I would argue that they went the wrong way. So OPEC said, OPEC could cut production or they could try to defend market share. And I said at the time, I think they'd be better off cutting production and just betting that the U.S. can't continue to add millions and millions of barrels. But they went the other way. They put more oil out of the market. So on Thanksgiving Day 2014, they declared war on the shale guys. And I've written about, I wrote about that about that time, and I said, that was OPEC's trillion dollar mistake, because that literally will end up costing them a trillion dollars. There's no guarantee that the other way would have worked either, but what they did ended up collapsing oil prices. Well, I get it. That, that's, a, that's a future slide. OPEC's reasoning, it was widely reported that shale oil needs, you know, 80 to $100 to be economical. And at the time, in, in uh, mid-2014, there was enough new oil coming on the market from the U.S. that the price was starting to break. The price had finally broken below $100, and it was about 75 and I think OPEC thought, okay, we'll go ahead and do these guys in, and they put more oil on the market, and they were thinking, and I know this because I was reading articles, contemporary articles at the time, where they said, you know, we're going to drop prices down to maybe $60, and we're going to keep them there, and we're going to put these guys out of business, and then we're going to be back in the driver's seat. And, you know, with so much of the oil reserves, they could play the long game. They could put all these shale guys out of business, and they could jump back into the driver's seat, and then OPEC is, is in control once again. What happened was they increased oil production or, or output by 2.8 million barrels a day at the same time the U.S. put all those barrels on the market. That circle right there shows why oil prices collapsed. The oil prices collapsed all the way into the 20s. OPEC way, way overdid it, and they didn't foresee that the shale oil guys would hang in the way they did. Some of them did go bankrupt, but production dipped a little bit in 2015, but then it continued to grow and OPEC grossly, and eventually OPEC waved the white flag and they said, okay, enough of this, and they went back to trying to, uh, to control prices. And when they did that, that's when oil prices started to recover out of the 30s, back up ultimately to, to where we are today. So high crude inventories from the previous paid collapsed the oil price, and there you can see it going all the way down into the 20s, which Again, if, if you told some of the peak oil people this in 2005, 2006, that oil, the WTI would again be in the 20s, they would have thought you were insane. So it cost, I, I calculated probably a couple of years of this, of uh, you know, the, the $20, $30 a barrel lower prices that OPEC was getting, will ultimately cost them a trillion dollars, if not more, and what were the outcomes from the shale boom? OPEC stranglehold on $100 oil was broken. Now, I'm, you think about it, the reason you are not paying $5 or more a gallon of gasoline is the U.S. shale oil boom. OPEC would gladly keep prices, I mean, the prices may have keep on going up. I mean, global demand did not decline when oil prices were $100 a barrel. Again, because of developing countries, China, India, kept consuming more and more oil. So OPEC would have happily, you know, run oil prices up to as high as they could, and uh, we would have made OPEC very, very rich. The outcome is OPEC lost control over oil prices, which seen by oil falling into the 20s and, and causing them great pain. U.S. net imports that at one point had gone over 12 million barrels a day have now dropped to almost nothing. U.S. is on a trajectory to become a net oil exporter if we continue the trajectory we're on. We're already a finished product exporter. What that means is we export more gasoline, diesel, finished products than we import. Nobody saw that coming. Consumers at the pump are saving more than $100 billion a year in transportation fuel costs. That doesn't count all the other things that have been talked about that are made out of oil. Consumers are saving so much money from, from the shale boom and the way it dropped prices and they don't appreciate it, they don't realize it, but you would be paying far more, you'd be paying thousands of dollars a year more had this boom never happened. 
So there's, there's what's happened when that imports. That delta right now is $400 billion of trade deficit. And if you, if you draw that line out, we're on a trajectory to, to go all the way to zero. So on the shale gas side, Natural gas prices that had spiked above $10, that ended. Utilities began switching from coal to natural gas. They increased consumption by 50% from 2005 to 2015. We're exporting tremendous natural gas now. We're building pipelines and exporting more and more to Mexico. Industrial demand has increased. Uh, there's a methanol plant that's been completely removed back to Louisiana to take advantage of low natural gas prices. Lots of manufacturing has come back to the U.S. just for this cheap natural gas. Uh, LNG exports have begun to boom, and the IEA forecasts that they will grow by 5% a year through 2050. That's a pretty good growth market there. And the U.S., if you don't believe it, pull the BP statistical review, and you can see uh, CO2 emissions year by year. The U.S., over that time frame of the shale boom, recorded the largest drop in CO2 emissions in the world. Now, admittedly, we were at a high level, but we have come down substantially because of, mainly because of the utilities swapping out coal for natural gas. Now, see how my time is. Um, I want to contrast Texas and California. What's happened in Texas, this is what most of the shale states look like. Most of the shale states, when the, when the shale boom took off, oil production there took off. Texas has added about 4 million barrels a day. And that little dip you see, that was OPEC's price war. That's when OPEC tried to take market share. And it, it did take a dip, but then it took off again. And if you look at Oklahoma, you look at Kansas, you look at New Mexico, Colorado, those states all look like that. And there's what California looks like. Now, that's a stark, stark contrast. There's not even a blip at all in the, uh, you know, there's no uptake at all uh, when, when all the other states started taking off. Ironically, if you go back to the early 2000s and you extrapolate Texas uh, uh, production decline, they were going to go below California probably about 2010. So without the shale oil boom, California would probably be the number one oil producing state in the country right now which they were 100 years ago, they'd probably be again. Most states would be continuing to decline, but states like, states like Texas just decline at a faster rate. And uh, we'd be talking about a very different picture in California. Um, instead, we're talking about, okay, what, what has gone wrong here? So why, shale, why California's oil output is declining? A century ago, California was trading places with Oklahoma back and forth for number one oil producer in the country. Many, many people don't know, outside of California, maybe outside of this area, what an important oil producing state California has been historically. Um, I ask people this all the time if they realize where California ranks, and people consistently uh, rank them much further down the list than they actually are. The Monterey Shale is a huge oil resource. That means there is a lot of oil in the ground. Um, you know, there will be oil there for thousands of years, much of it inaccessible. The problems are the oil formations in some cases are too close to aquifers, the geology is folded and more complex, it's naturally fractured, it's not as conducive for this, these long horizontals that you can, you can drill in Texas. Um, as I prepared these slides, I started looking at the rig counts in Texas and California. And what I found, only 20% of California's land rigs, there, there's only, there was only 15 when I checked, 15 rigs, and it dropped to as low as six earlier in the year. Um, and uh, I should mention, you have an unfavorable regulatory regime here. There's local bans on fracking and so forth, largely because people don't know. If, if oil prices were $150 a barrel, you probably don't have so much opposition here, and you've got people saying, you know, please, please get on with this. But not in my backyard. That's always the case. Nobody wants any oil production or any energy production, period. You know, nobody wants a wind turbine next to their house. Um, that's just, it's natural. I checked in Texas. This is what uh, drilling locations look like in Texas. That's the Permian Basin out in the, uh, in the west. There's 502 rigs as of a couple of weeks ago in Texas. 
90, 92% of those were horizontally drilled. Almost all of those will eventually be fracked. And in California, there was, at the time, there were nine. There were a few in this area. Um, only three of those, three out of the 15, were horizontally drilled. 11 were directional. So with a more complex geology, you have directional drilling, but you just don't have those long horizontals, and that makes it more expensive. And that's why uh, that is a major reason that California is not having a Texas-like shale boom. So I've talked about benefits. Uh, you know, there's no question that the shale boom has benefited the pocketbooks of almost every American, but shale, uh, the, the fracking gets a bad rap. And there's some legitimate reasons, there's some not so legitimate reasons. All energy production involves trade-offs, every, everything. Um, you know, wind, wind turbines, they have, their, they have their issues, oil production, nuclear, everything has some trade-offs. The problem with fracking is that it started to move into the populated areas of the Northeast. And, you know, where it had been done in Oklahoma for decades, in Texas for decades, now it's being done on these little, you know, these little farms in the Northeast where there's never been any energy production and people are seeing more traffic, they're seeing more industrial activity in areas that uh, have been quiet and idyllic for a long time. And an anti-fracking movement, uh, Josh Fox, they, they, the story is they came to him to frack on his land and he said, oh, this doesn't sound good, and uh, he made the movie Gasland, which is classified as a documentary, it's mostly fiction. Um, there, there are many, many sensationalized claims in that movie, many just completely inaccurate claims the truth is, fracking has been around in the Midwest for 70 years. If it was easy to contaminate aquifers with fracking, we would have no clean water left. I mean, the, the clean water would have been gone a long time ago. As I prepared this presentation, I actually wrote an article for Forbes, Why the Shale Boom Left California Behind. And one of the points that I've made, and a point that I've made before, with, uh, with farmers in the Midwest who've said, you know, we got to do ethanol and we got to get away from this oil. Uh, you know, fracking is poisoning the water supply. And I said, you are dumping far more pollutants right on top of the ground, right above the aquifers. And I made the claim in that Forbes article that every year in California, farmers dump thousands of tons of fertilizer directly on top of the ground. And an angry farmer from this area sent me an email and he said, you should stick to what you know. You obviously don't know anything. He said, I put one pound an acre of nitrogen fertilizer on my land, blah, blah, blah. You stick to your lane and I'll stick to my lane. I don't mind arguing with people. So I did respond. And I quoted um, the, one of the water, the water commission here, and they said every year California farmers dump 550,000 tons of nitrogen fertilizer directly on the ground, directly on top of the aquifers. Now, at the time, I said, obviously, aquifers aren't that easy to contaminate. Well, I found out you do have nitrates from those fertilizers in your aquifers. So you are getting some of that in there. Fracking, when done properly, is done thousands of feet below these aquifers. And these fractures are only a few hundred feet long. And so the notion that you're going to contaminate aquifers from you know, a fracture that may be two miles below and on, on the picture I showed earlier, one of the reasons I like that, that picture of, that shows fracking, you can always tell if somebody's got an agenda. If they have an agenda, they show the frack just below the aquifer. If they don't, they might show something that's more to scale. So you've got the aquifer here, and you've got the frack way, way down here. But a lot of these guys, you know, you, you, you look at a depiction of fracking, and you'll see the aquifer here, and fracking right here, and you'll see the little lines going into the aquifer. And that's, uh, that's mostly fiction. However, there is some reason for, for caution and for concern. Most people, as I said, they don't want energy production in their backyard. So he protested a frack operation near his house. He, he didn't want it near his house. Nobody likes, likes energy production close by. They'd like their, you know, the flip the light switch on, they have energy, and wherever it's produced is far away, it doesn't affect me at all. So what can happen with fracking? It is possible for a well to pass through an aquifer. It's possible for that well to leak. That has happened. That happened in the Northeast. As far as anybody uh, that's opposed to fracking is concerned, that's fracking that did it. Fracking contaminated my well. 
And I've had these arguments with people, and they say, you know, I don't care that it's not specific to fracking. It is the whole supply chain of fracking that caused this well to be contaminated. It is possible to frack too close to an aquifer. I mean, if you have an aquifer that's a few hundred feet deep and your pay zone is a thousand feet deep, you should not frack that. You, you could get some chemicals into the water supply. That is possible. Of importance to Californians, Oklahoma now leads the nation in earthquakes. We have more earthquakes in my home state than you do here, and it is a byproduct of fracking. It's not from the fracking, because the fracking is done much deeper than these geological zones, these, these active faults, but wastewater injection, they're not drilling nearly as deep, and they are injecting wastewater directly into these seismically active zones, and they are causing earthquakes in Oklahoma, and that's, that's a fact. Um, in Canada, uh, I think in the DuVernay, they have confirmed that fracking there, and, and even in Oklahoma, they've determined that one to two percent of the earthquakes there are directly a result of fracking. So there you can say, okay, it's one of the trade-offs. It's saving us, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars a year, but earthquakes are in Oklahoma. You know, if I live in, in uh, Montana, maybe I don't care. You know, people, people it's, again, it's, if it's not in my backyard, I don't care so much about it. All right, conclusions, last slide. The combination of hydraulic fracturing, horizontal drilling, reshaped the global landscape entirely. Um, consumers have enjoyed huge financial benefits of this. You know, OPEC would be in a much, much stronger position. We would be enriching them right now if not for the shale boom, which has increased U.S. energy security. Contribution to trade deficit has plummeted. Carbon dioxide emissions have plummeted because of what uh, utilities have done with coal and natural gas. And California has missed out for a variety of reasons, but the geology is such that maybe you never have a Texas-type shale boom here, although I think you can increase oil production with the right policies in place. And finally, I'd say the environmental implications are overblown, but there are some legitimate concerns. And with that, I thank you for inviting me. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here. And uh, I, I, I originally thought there'd be time for questions, but I don't think, I don't think we're going to do that.